to introduce to you Megan Foley Nippon to present her speech on twice exceptionality. Twice exceptional learners who are gifted students with disabilities are a mostly misunderstood and neglected segment of students. For years, gifted students with disabilities were thought to be at opposite ends of the intelligence spectrum. It was not until the 1970s that educators realized gifted students also could have disabilities. Our dis uh, distinguished presenter, Megan Foley Nikpan, who works on this important subject of twice exceptionality, has been affiliated with the Bellin Blank Center at the University of Iowa since completing her PhD in 2003, acting as a project manager, postdoctoral scholar, psychologist, and administrator. She has worked on several major grants, including work on the federally funded Iowa Twice Exceptional Study. Her research and clinical interests include assessment and intervention of high ability students with autism, ADHD, and emotional learning difficulties. Her rich search has appeared in several distinguished journals and has over 30 referred articles and over 50 presentations at international, national, and regional conferences. Megan Foley Nikpon was awarded the Outstanding Research Award in Counseling and Human Development by the American Educational Research Association and twice the Mensa Research Award by Mensa Education and Research Foundation. Now I invite Megan Foley Nikpon to make her presentation on what is exceptional about twice exceptionality. Okay, can you hear me? All right, hopefully everyone can hear me. Thank you so much for that nice introduction and for the opportunity to speak to all of you about something I am extremely passionate about, twice exceptional children. Let me first start by telling you why this population is so special to me and the experiences I have had that make it possible for me to talk so deeply about this topic. So you already heard about me, but just a little bit more. I'm a licensed psychologist and I've been with the Baum Blank Center performing assessment, therapy, consultation services with twice exceptional students for almost 10 years. I also am an associate professor and my predominant research interest is with twice exceptional students. And I teach courses in psychopathology, assessment, practicum, and all the things associated with psychology so that young minds can learn how to be good psychologists. And then third, I'm a mother. And I want to tell you a quick story. This morning I was off running and I had a wonderful run and I was all happy and I came home, came home, came back to the hotel and I called home and said, how's everything going? And my husband said, well, it's been a great morning. Connor threw up at 6 a.m. Grace, she's learning how to potty train. She pooped in her pants and Danny came downstairs and said, where's my breakfast? So I am very grateful that I have someone at home who took care of my kids while I was here. So anyway, I think that he drew the short stick for that one. So, But why I'm telling you also about my kids is that my oldest, Danny, was diagnosed as twice exceptional two years ago. So this is a very personal topic for me as well. The insights I've gained in my research and clinical experiences are going to inform these top 10 things I hope that you come to understand about twice exceptionality at the conclusion of my talk. At number 10, we have what is the definition of twice exceptionality? So what does it mean to be a twice exceptional child? Well, 
The exact introduction of the term twice exceptionality into the literature is unclear. June Maker's 1977 book, Providing Programs for the Gifted Handicapped, likely is the first book to be devoted to gifted students with disabilities over the years. I'm sorry, I'm having issues here. Huh, my slides went all over the place. Sorry about that, I don't know what's going on. I've lost everything. Hmm. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. I'm on the right slide, but this is really, really great. <laughs> I want to tab down so I can see all of those slides, and when I do that, it moves my whole slide. My mouse went away because I need to be able to see all my notes. There is a next okay. one, there will be though. Okay, there you go. Okay, okay, I'm glad nobody left. <laughs> well, maybe someone did, but okay. Sorry. Okay, so I was telling you about the history of twice exceptionality. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's still, I don't know, my notes are still going away, but we'll try. Yeah, it's still flashing. Okay, so there's been lots of authors who have talked about twice exceptionality since this time, and the term is becoming more, I can't read my notes, more common in the field in different domains, um, but it, oftentimes there's a lack of understanding about what the term is, and this can obstruct identification and service provision. Because in order to intervene or accommodate, we must first understand what the problem is. And for the twice exceptional, this may not be obvious. So a definition from an article we wrote in 2006 is as follows. A student is considered twice exceptional when he or she is identified as gifted in one or more areas while also possessing a learning, emotional, physical, sensory, or auditory, or developmental disability. This being said, there is no one way to describe twice exceptionality because some students who fall under this umbrella may have high overall ability and low academic achievement, others may have high achievement and ability with social and emotional concerns, and still others may have artistic or leadership talents with social and communication deficits. However, all will show differences between potential and achievement that require attention to bridge this gap. Most of the research and theoretical writings examine twice exceptionality in general, as well as how it manifests in gifted children with autism, ADHD, or learning disabilities. The exact prevalence is not known for several reasons. One is that there's no formal way of tracking the students, so what's considered gifted and talented in one state or one country may not be the same as in another country or state or city. Also, there's a phenomenon called the masking effect. 
So sometimes kids aren't identified as either gifted or as having learning disabilities. That happens oftentimes with gifted students um, with learning disabilities. Sometimes kids are identified as gifted and talented but not as uh, possessing a disability or diagnosis like autism. And then sometimes kids are identified, and I was just talking to a woman earlier, if they have a behavior problem, I've heard countless times people say, well, since they have a behavior problem, they couldn't also be gifted. So that brings me to number nine. The, except, the twice exceptional student, as we've learned from the definition, it's so true that the norm is the exception to the norm. And the next graph depicts this concept exactly. So, in this graph, we've depicted the mean values for a sample of twice exceptional students we've reported on in our various research studies that have come from the Bell and Blank Center's Assessment and Counseling Clinic. Of course, there always is individual variation and difference, but this graph depicts how the norm for the twice exceptional is truly the exception to the norm. So this is a graph of the normal curve. The white is considered the quote unquote normal range. The yellow is considered um, above average to very superior. And the blue is considered low average and below. So starting with strengths, you can tell on the graph, which it's funny, on my little screen, it goes away. So I'm doing my best with my technical impairments here. And they're all my own personal ones because I don't know how to fix it. But anyway, the, if you look at the top of the normal curve, you'll see that these kids in our sample have really incredible abilities and a lot of them have very high achievement. You'll see very little in the quote unquote normal range. And then you'll see at the other end of the spectrum, you'll see a lot of problems with adaptability and behavioral problems. And you'll also see that processing speed, while it's still in the normal range, it's much lower than the other scores that are affiliated with ability. So what does that mean? That concept informs this next one, that working memory and processing speed are the building blocks to learning, and they are relatively weak in many twice exceptional students. This is a very important point, and Linda Silverman talked extensively about this in her presentation. Thank you very much. So hopefully everyone will really understand it while I'm talking about it now. So on the WISC-4, that's a common ability test that is administered to gifted children. There are four factors. The verbal comprehension index, the perceptual reasoning index, the working memory index, and the processing speed index. So among gifted and talented children, the verbal and nonverbal reasoning scores are typically higher than the working memory and processing speed scores, just like Linda said. This is why many psychologists use the general ability index, which is a factor score that does not incorporate working memory and processing speed, in talking about overall ability, ability among gifted children over a full-scale IQ. But what's striking is that among twice exceptional students, the discrepancy is often even more significant. So what do I mean? Here's some data from a sample of 95 children, 52 of whom were identified as gifted, and 43 were identified as gifted and also having ADHD. So the published article that goes with this data examines self-concept and self-esteem, but I'd like to focus on IQ comparisons for now. So on this graph, as you can see, first looking at the full-scale IQ, I give the mean scores for the gifted children with ADHD first, then the mean scores for the gifted only group, and then significance means when I do a mean comparison, are they considered significantly different, okay? So here, the full scale IQ score is significantly different. It's only four points, but that means a lot. A lot of times when kids, there's a cut score for admission into a gifted and talented program, okay? Now look at the general ability index. There is no significant difference there, right? That's because when you're looking at the GAI, it doesn't take into account that working memory and processing speed indices, which are the last two rows on the graph. Look at processing speed. Processing speed is a seven point difference that's significant. That means something, okay? 
Working memory, that's a six point difference. That's significant and that means something. As well, perceptual reasoning, which I, was, I found surprising, there was a five point difference and that also was significant. The only thing that wasn't was the verbal skills of these kids, okay? I'm sure that processing speed was affected because as Linda talked about, one of those tests is timed. And so that always influences that overall score. So to me, the take home message here is that IQ profiles look different among gifted children with ADHD than they do among gifted children without a diagnosis. And this is very, very important when it comes to both identification and intervention with this population. Here's some more data to emphasize my point. This is another example from an article where we predicted the academic performance of gifted students with autism spectrum disorder based on ability profiles. There is no comparison group, but I'd like to show you the means and standard deviations for this group. When we examined how these ICE-Q scores influence academic performance, we found that working memory and processing speed were important factors to the academic success of high ability youth with autism. So if you look at these scores, right, the mean score for the VCI, the verbal and the nonverbal, they were in the superior range. Working memory was in that high average range, and then processing speed was considered average, okay? So those skills weren't advanced. Those skills are what predicted academic success in math, reading, and written language. That shocked us. And those verbal skills did not predict act academic performance. So what does that mean? Oh, and let me tell you something else. Independently predictive, so for math achievement, processing speed was very predictive. And for written language achievement, working memory was predictive. So the take home message here is despite relatively high verbal and nonverbal abilities, the students in our sample who had autism spectrum disorder struggled with working memory and processing speed tests relatively, and absolutely I would say for processing speed. And this is common amongst all students with autism. So it is possible that the IQ profiles of gifted students with autism should be interpreted differently than those of gifted students without a disability because of the differing extent to which the index scores relate to performance on academic assessments. So if you have an academic measure as a screening tool, they, those scores may be suppressed, right? Because that processing speed and working memory is affecting what those scores look like. So think about that. In the state of Iowa, we have an achievement measure as a screening for admission into gifted and talented programming. So that brings me to number seven. Twice exceptional children have a lowered self-concept. I again will use data to demonstrate my point here. Researchers have found that gifted children with ADHD face risks similar to children with ADHD who are not identified as gifted, including school performance difficulties, school functioning, and mental health concerns. So in our study of gifted children with ADHD, they were more likely to indicate overall self-esteem difficulties than gifted children without ADHD, as well as lower feelings of happiness and behavioral satisfaction. So some people think that being gifted is kind of a protective factor, and it may not be if you also have a, a mental health protective factor, but it may not be if you also have a diagnosis of ADHD. Among gifted children with learning disabilities, and I lost my text again, there's also often a difference between expected and actual outcomes in terms of academic performance. And this could be perceived as laziness or underachievement instead of an actual disability. And when we looked at the self-concepts and self-esteems of gifted children with learning disabilities, they varied widely, okay? So to me, the take home message here is when working with twice exceptional students, we need to be alert to clues that may indicate that they're having some difficulties in terms of their self-concept and self-esteem. So things like withdrawing from activities they used to find interesting, having a low mood, being tearful, 
with heightened sensitivity, those things may indicate that they should be referred to talk to somebody about some of the difficulties that they're facing. And number six I have, we need to think long and hard about how we identify gifted children with learning disabilities. There is quite a bit of controversy and discussion regarding this issue. And I could talk all day about just this one issue. And I have great notes that I can't see. Now I can, okay. So one model for identification is the ability achievement discrepancy, which refers to a significant difference between the student's cognitive ability and their achievement. For example, students with average cognitive ability are expected to have average academic performance. Sometimes gifted students can have high ability with lower academic performance. Okay, so sometimes though, gifted children had to, it was called the wait to fail. So they had to wait until the discrepancy was large enough that they were identified. And so some people recently have said that this model is not adequate. An emerging model, oh another thing with that, is that in our state, if you had average achievement, you weren't identified as having a disability anyway because it was average and average was considered good enough. So an emerging model that is increasingly being applied to gifted populations in America's schools is response to intervention. So Lichtenstein in 2008 described RTI, which is an approach that features remediation through classroom intervention, as a specific example of an alternative approach to the discrepancy model. The ability achievement discrepancy model was typically applied by psychologists who are trained and they know how to administer and interpret cognitive ability and achievement assessments. Whereas RTI, the RTI model relies heavily on classroom teachers. Not that that's a bad thing, it's just a totally different model. Another concern with RTI is that average performance is again not addressed. So only the lowest five, eight, ten, whatever the cutoff is for that particular area, those students are the ones that get extra services. So I've seen this play out countless times in our clinic as problematic. Students will be struggling significantly within an academic domain because their advanced thinking does not transfer into comparable work. I've seen student after student identified as having a 30 plus point, 45, as sometimes 60 point differences in their ability and achievement, yet they do not receive services in schools because average is good enough. Well, average is not good enough when your thinking is way out here. It's a complete disconnect, okay? So kids think so advanced and then they're writing and so simplistic. That is so frustrating. And I said, and it's true, it's so disheartening and unfair to the thousands of gifted and talented students with learning disabilities who go unserved. I am not saying that methods such as response intervention are not helpful. They are and they can be. I think data administered through met these methods could be used wonderfully to screen potential 2E. But using any method as a gatekeeper for children who need extra help is just as ineffective as allowing them to wait to fail. In the new Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which was, it's used by people like me and psychiatrists in the U.S. to make mental health diagnoses, it was just published in 2013, and there's some statements there about gifted students with learning disabilities that I'd like to share with you all. First, let me just give you the definition. It says that you have to have difficulties with learning and it has to be in a specific academic domain. This time it's only one. And it's interesting that it could just be in spelling, which I'm a terrible speller. I always think, good thing I would have been in trouble. So thank goodness for spell check. Um, and then it also says there's a point in there that it has to be below age level expectations. So that's again problematic for us when we are working with gifted students when their discrepancy puts them at the average range academically. Then the language specific to gifted students is as follows. Specific learning disabilities may occur in individuals identified as intellectually gifted. These individuals may be able to sustain apparently adequate academic functioning by using compensatory strategies, extraordinarily high effort, or support until the learning demands or assessment procedures, for example, time test, 
post barriers to their demonstrating their learning or accomplishing required tasks. So clearly there still is work to be done in terms of understanding and implementing best practice and identifying gifted students with learning disabilities. The methodologies chosen must, must optimize performance, not write off difficulties as unimportant. Number five, some twice exceptional children may have limited insight into their strengths and areas for growth. So here, looking at some more data, in 2010 we conducted a study of gifted children and adolescents with autism, and we found that parents and sometimes teachers may observe symptoms of depression, inattention, hyperactivity, difficulty coping with change, but the adolescents and children themselves didn't report any of these problems. There was a big difference. They saw no problems in any of those areas. Similar to gifted children with autism, gifted children with learning disabilities may have limited insight into their social and behavioral difficulties. Given their self-reported observations of their behavior differed from those made by parents and teachers in another study we, connect, we conducted. So all of this information presented up to this point gives evidence of why I think number four is so important. A comprehensive evaluation is key to identifying strengths and areas for growth among the twice exceptional. So I'm going to demonstrate this concept through a case comparison study I conducted with my colleagues Susan Asseline and Alyssa Dubay. This is a story of two girls who were referred to our center because they were, making cons they were considered considerably smart, but they each had difficulties making friends and navigating their social worlds. In the article, we referred to them as Carrie and Hannah. So Carrie was evaluated in our clinic when she was 11, and then later at when she was 14. She was accelerated from the sixth to the eighth grade. She met developmental milestones on time or early. For example, she read when she was 30 months. Do the quick math to years. And um, she was described as disorganized, forgetful, having difficulty with daily activities, and really uninterested in peer relationships. Hannah was not accelerated, but she was identified for gifted and talented programming. She met all of her developmental milestones early or within normal limits, and she was described as having social difficulties. She had also reserved, um, excuse me, received special social skills counseling. So I want to show you the comparisons between the two. These are their WISC score, um, four scores. First I have Hannah, and then, um, I'm sorry, first I have Carrie, then Hannah. I'll always talk about Carrie first. You'll see that they're almost indistinguishable, except for processing speed. So Carrie's processing speed was in the high average range, while, at, while Hannah's was still in the superior range. But look at those verbal scores. I mean, these are the nonverbal scores. They're just exceptionally, profoundly gifted students. Now, they also were exceptionally able academically. So look at those reading scores, reading, math, written language, oral language, all fantastic. The only difference was on a test called story recall. So what we do here is we read stories to kids and then they have to repeat them back to you. And you do that immediately and they get increasingly longer and harder and then you do it after a delay. And Carrie did well, but not nearly as well as she did in the other tasks. And I think that's likely due to some working memory difficulties. But I bet whatever she remembered, she remembered after the delay, because the delay score is even better than her immediate recall score. And then Hannah was just phenomenal. Her ability to remember those stories was out of this world. The next thing we did was look at, it's called adaptive functioning, and this is a very important measure when you're looking to make an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. So here the girls had some similarities and some differences. The biggest difference was in communication. So even though Carrie has an amazingly high verbal comprehension index, her ability to communicate in terms of having conversations with people, so your basic communications needs, those were considered average, whereas Hannah's were, were considered superior. Then we'll go to socialization. 
Carrie's socialization score was in the third, fifth percentile. So her ability to make friends, cope with stress, those sorts of things were on one end of the normal curve, way at the bottom, and then her IQ and her ability is way off the charts on the other end. So within the same little kiddo, she has just such differing things going on. That's really tough, and it's tough for her to understand, and it's tough for everyone around her to understand. Okay, this is a very hard slide to, to interpret, so I'll do my best to, to summarize it for you. Um, this is from the BASC, it's the Behavioral Assessment Skills for Children. This is a screening measure that we give to kids who come in our clinic. And the scores that are in, not in italics, not in italics high percentages mean re reporting more of those symptoms. And then for terms in italics, low percentages mean reporting more of those symptoms. So here's, I go from self to parent, and then at the bottom are the teacher. So Carrie, she did report difficulties with parents, peers, and she said she wasn't very self-reliant, okay? Hannah reported many more psychosocial concerns. Remember what I said, kids with autism often don't perceive as much psychosocial difficulties. Hannah said she was in control of her life, she had str social stress, she reported feeling sad, and she said she had a hard time making friends. Now the parents and the teachers are much different. Carrie's mom reported symptoms of atypicality. That's a measure looking at things like there's items on there like seems out of touch with reality, seems in her own world. I don't like that word atypicality, but it's, it's behaviors that are outside of what you would expect for the child at that developmental level. Withdrawn socially, she seemed to have trouble with social skills and then communicating her basic needs. Hannah's mom noticed that with those withdrawn from social situation symptoms and then social skills problems. Carrie's teacher reported some conduct problems. I guess she was having arguing with kids. Um, she was a hard time paying attention. Some of those odd behaviors seemed withdrawn. Had a hard time adapting to change some social skills difficulties, and then leader, did not possess many leadership skills. Whereas Hannah's teachers noted some of those odd or different behaviors, withdrawn, and difficulty adapting to change. So, we gave both of them measures specific to diagnosing autism. And here, if you look, I provided what the cut scores are. So you have to receive scores above this cut score in order to have enough symptoms in that category to be, cons that to be considered problematic. And as you can see, Carrie surpassed the cutoff, particularly in reciprocal social interactions. So that's the give and take that happens in social relationships, right? And Hannah only had one symptom. Then, I should say too, the ADOS is an interactive assessment I do with kids, like we read books, we talk about stuff, I give them toys to play with. It's all trying to elicit behaviors associated with autism spectrum disorder. Then the ADIR is a long developmental interview. It takes about two to two and a half hours to complete. And you look at behaviors currently as well as when the child was younger. And that's because autism is a developmental disability. So you really need to know what the child or what the adult looked like when they were three or four. That's very, very important. So here, as you can tell, Carrie had symptoms in the areas indicative of autism spectrum disorder, but Hannah did not. So what does this mean? This means that Kiri had a diagnosis, I mean profoundly gifted with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, and Hannah did not. But Hannah very, very easily, and had been, misdiagnosed as having autism, or having Asperger's syndrome, because she was withdrawn socially, because she had difficulty making friends. But I hope one thing you all remember is that those characteristics, that does not mean you have autism. So there is no single diagnostic profile that one can discover through the administration of psychoeducational assessment tools that says, ding, 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 there's a twice exceptional student. That doesn't happen. 
However, patterns exist that could alert, alert professionals to consider the same student could have an academic or cognitive gift as well as a disability. Only through comprehensive evaluation can you identify individual strengths and areas for growth so that appropriate programming and intervention can be designed. Number three, the best educational plans highlight strengths and accommodate difficulties, and I should have bolded it in that order. As parents and educators, we must be mindful of the delicate balance between providing talent development opportunities and remediating deficits. If one constantly focuses on what he or she is not good at, it can only be damaging to your self-esteem and self-concept. I see this play out consistently with children in our clinic. If a child excels in reading and written language but struggles in math, how much time should be spent on improving the deficit versus fostering the talent? In reality, that child is not going to seek a career in which they're doing all math. They're going to fly to where they're good at things, okay? So how do we set this child up for success? So as emphasized throughout this talk, successful identification of an intervention with twice exceptional students not only focuses on the diagnos diagnosis and remediation, but also on talent domain selection and programming. When students are not allowed to participate simultaneously in both gifted and special education programming, their complex needs may go unmet. So some specific ideas include ensuring that the twice exceptional individuals have access to gifted and talented programming, including acceleration. Through review of records of each client, you need to take into consideration both strengths and weaknesses when you plan a pro programs in and out of the classroom. Very importantly, I think almost all twice exceptional kids are not fast processors, not 100%, but a, a universal recommendation I can say is no more time tests and allow them sufficient time to process information that's being presented. So that doesn't mean you can't accelerate them, but let them take the time they need to, to whatever it's called, take in the information and learn it. Okay, that's super important. Understand how um, the diagno individual's diagnosis was determined and become aware of the rights afforded to that individual in your country, state, region, or town in which you live. Set a goal to promote the individual's development of self-advocacy and um, problem-solving skills. This is incredibly important for when students transition to college and they're going to be, need to be in a situation where they self-advocate. Number two, there is still a lot of work to be done. In a recent study that I conducted with some colleagues, 317, in, 317 individuals completed an online twice exceptional needs assessment, which consisted of 14 questions assessing issues pertaining to twice exceptionality, knowledge and experience, as well as knowledge of policies relevant to both gifted and special education. Results indicated that educators were more familiar with standards in their specific area of expertise, either gifted or special education, and that fewer professionals were familiar with the use of response intervention with twice exceptional children. So gifted education professionals had significantly more knowledge and experience with twice exceptionality than did professionals in other domains. So our findings suggest that the concept is more readily accepted in our field, and that is great news. When I started at the Bumbling Center 10 years ago, it was not, and certainly as a social worker, before I went to graduate school, I didn't know about it. When I was working in hospitals, I didn't know about it. So we're, we're getting the word out, but like I said, not until I was more immersed in the field did I know. We really need to get out there and engage in more professional development opportunities outside of our field. I also conducted a 20-year analysis of the empirical literature examining, examining twice exceptionality. This was in uh, American journals. And we found that only 43 empirical studies had been conducted in that past 20 years. That's just over two a year. That's very depressing. So we, we said that we really need to get out there and do more research, okay? So 
What I recommend is that scholars who study twice exceptionalities must draw on the already existing research within the broader diagnostic categories of learning disability, ADHD, and autism to ensure that the questions asked are relevant and timely. Cross-disciplinary approaches must be employed to access, incorporate, and build on relevant research from other domains, such as special education, neuroscience, school psychology, and counseling psychology. So this requires consideration of more complex methodologies that involve larger sample sizes, randomized control trials, and neuroimaging techniques. Through this lens, scholars will be begin to better understand the ways in which high ability affects disability. This is necessary to ensure that twice exceptionality is included in the larger discussion of disability in general. We need to become relevant to all different fields. Last year, Dr. Betsy McCoach asked whether I would be the Gifted Child Quarterly Guest Editor for a special issue on twice exceptionality, and I said yes. The number one goal was to increase the empirical investigation of twice exceptionality to move it from a theoretical concept to an operationalized definition with associated research-based identification and intervention strategies that work. The researchers highlighted in this issue will, that will be published this fall, it's the next issue, unveil groundbreaking findings in diverse areas within the broad definition of twice exceptionality. So readers will learn about screening, identification, characteristics, intervention, and support strategies all through empirical investigation. So there's five more studies. So it's, it's progress, and please make sure to check it out. And the number one most important thing that you need to know about twice exceptional kids is that they're awesome. They're amazing. So I'm going to show you this through two examples, and you really need to hear about these kids. The first one we have is Mary, and these aren't their real names. Um, Mary was diagnosed as gifted with autism in our clinic when she was 11. Prior to this, she was diagnosed with ADHD, but stimulant medication was not effective. A comprehensive evaluation in our clinic revealed that she was indeed brilliant, but also had autism. Once properly identified, she thrived, and let me show you some examples of how. So first, here's a poem that she wrote when she was 14, and I can't see it on here, so, because my slides keep jumping, so I'll give you a minute to read that. I just love that because it, to me, depicts twice exceptionality. When she was 14, she wrote a story about what it means to be twice exceptional. And I want to read most of this story to you. I'll take out a couple parts. It's beautiful. I am sure every teen would say, no one understands me. But I believe my statement is different in many respects. I believe no one has ever really understood me. I don't even totally understand myself, and I have worked very hard on this with counselors and other professionals. All of my life, both teachers and kids have never really tried to understand me. They just looked at me as weird. School was so rough my first year that I changed schools after kindergarten to attend a school where my mother teaches. I started medication, which helped me stay out of trouble, no more frequent flyer passes to the principal. In elementary school, kids are forced to be nice, so I thought I had friends. But I didn't understand the definition of friend until I became older. So it is not surprising that I didn't really see any of my friends from back there anymore, from back then anymore. Elementary school was boring, but the teachers were impressed with what I knew. One teacher would have this talk with me before a lesson she taught. She would say, quote, I know you already know all about this lesson, but the rest of the class needs to figure this out on their own. So I need you to sit quietly and not answer the questions. I will call on you and let you talk at the end. So I spent much of elementary school reading a book and waiting. It's a good thing that my medication worked. 
When I skipped a grade going into middle school, I wondered how I was going to make friends when I'd left all my old ones behind. To keep me going, I told myself that I would have only enough friends by my birthday to have a good birthday party. I only ever made two or three friends. The rest were acquaintances at best. In middle school, no one really respected me for being intelligent anymore. Instead of looking at me with awe, they looked at me as a know-it-all or a teacher's pet whenever I raised my hand in class. But I had two strikes against me. I was smart and I did not speak the teenager code. This is the kiss of death in middle school, is it not? The teenager code is spoken in a language I could not understand. The teenager code is expressed in words, clothing, actions, and gestures. Latin is so much easier to learn than this illogical teenage language. I did, however, quickly learn one part of the teenage code, the social ladder. My position on the bottom rungs made it impossible for kids I knew since birth to, take me, to talk to me in the halls at school. I respected this part of the code, which probably saved me some additional teasing. Not only did I have to deal with the teenage code, I now had to learn new people for every class. This is especially hard for someone who has problems with faces. In seventh grade, I remember trying to get everyone straight in a class where we had to do a lot of group work. I finally got it right near the end of the year after one boy dyed his hair pink for Wacky Hair Day and it didn't wash out for two weeks. That was enough of a clue for me to finally match one person with a name. In eighth grade, I relished the time I spent in the counselor's office working on high school, high school level courses. There, I was able to get away from it all. I was even allowed to eat lunch in there. This time away was refreshing because many things about school are overwhelming. I never liked the lunchroom. It was crowded and noisy, and you had to shout to make yourself heard. Retrieving items from a locker can be brutal. There isn't enough space to get in and you have to wait your turn or you may be late. In the hurry of everything, you have to deal with the other locker doors slamming into you and the guilty people running off without a word. The halls, halls are crowded and loud, even the lights can be annoying. Much of this overstimulation can be dealt with and temporarily pushed aside unless you are having a bad day and then it overflows. Several times in seventh and eighth grade, I succumbed to tears. I always tear up every time I read this. Feeling that it was all hopeless. I developed a reputation as a crybaby. My classmates would say, oh, are you gonna cry? That teasing itself made me cry. Teachers didn't always stop the teasing either. I ended up quitting choir, one of my favorite activities, because this teasing went uncontrolled all year. Ugh. When I left middle school, I dreaded high school, assuming it would be the worst bump in the road. More teasing, more people cussing, people two or three feet taller than me. These were all very terrifying prospects. I begged my parents to have me homeschooled. However, my first day, true day of high school, it was not nearly as bad as I had expected. I found myself in a classroom environment in which I made friends and acquaintances. When I started doing extracurricular activities, however, that was when I made true, honest-to-goodness friends. There was one boy who was a freshman like me, and we were taking the same sophomore class. We both were in speech and debate and orchestra, and later on, quiz bowl. I loved being among people with the same interests as me, rather than the random jumble we are all placed in when we're in class. That's when I realized that all my, quote, friends before had been people who perhaps sympathized with me, perhaps felt pity, and so they allowed me into their group. However, my new friends understood that what I said without, understood what I said without me having to explain myself. They thought my quirks were interesting rather than freaky or weird, and they even didn't get annoyed with me. Even recently, during a speech and de debate meeting, when someone cussed me out really horribly, it was the opinion of the group that the offender should be kicked out. One member even called me at home to make sure I was okay. These are things friends do, and I am beginning to understand this. I try to be a friend back by doing all these things well. I also do my best to communicate properly, but social jokes often go over my head.
I get very confused when I make an innocent comment and have everyone burst out laughing because of the way it sounded. Luckily, now there is often there someone there to explain it to me. Remarkable girl. So today, this wonderful Mary is accelerated again and she's attending college. And I got a note from her mom, I just wanna read part of it. She said, when I watch her speak, I'm amazed with how much she has learned and overcome. She's still quirky, but not the same child I brought to you several years ago. And light years different from the child I had to hold the, I had to hold the chin of to get her to look at me. So we cannot give up hope on these kids. They're incredibly special. A quick second example I'll share with you. This one's shorter. I don't have a story. But this is Danny, and he was diagnosed through a comprehensive evaluation when he was eight. Prior to this, he was always seen as just average. But when you talk to him, people would say, wow, that kid's really smart. Um, they perceived him as exceptionally verbal and a deep thinker. So he was diagnosed with ADHD, and his parents tried five different medications. They kept wanting to quit before they found one that worked. And it really did work, it really helped him. So upon reflecting back on his eighth year, the year in which he was diagnosed, he said that the number one best thing that happened to him was that his parents found out he was both gifted and had ADHD. So now going into fifth grade, his grades have improved, but he is still perceived as average to high average in many academic domains. Math is still a challenge. He has accommodations to address his attention difficulties, but his parents have sought enrichment visual arts experience for him, and his overall academic self-concept has improved tremendously. So I just want to share some of his artwork with you. This is a drawing he did when he was eight. I don't know much about art, but I think it's pretty good. This is another one he drew on a cocktail napkin at a restaurant after one of his soccer games. And that was his image of his goal, which made me laugh because I can't imagine that he did a flip when he did his goal. And he says that he wants to be an architect or a soccer player, whichever is more fun. And then this is, a, this is kind of hard to see, but he was in a Belm Blank Center visual arts camp this summer. I worked this summer as a school psychologist, essentially, with the Twice Exceptional Kids. And this is one of his creations. And what's cool about it is it's three-dimensional. So the, the front is the window, and there's flowers on the window and binoculars, and then a view of the city is the second layer. And then the third layer is the grassy knoll behind. So. Human progress is neither, neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless ex ex exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. As a field, we have made substantial progress toward gaining greater knowledge about effective identification and intervention strategies for the twice exceptional because of the impassioned work of many committed professionals, a lot of whom are in this room. We don't have all the answers, but we are increasingly asking the right questions. I am deeply committed to moving forward on the path of greater understanding and support for these amazing children and their families. Thank you.